Hello, everybody, and welcome to this session about SWE in 2024. Last year was huge for SWE. We began 2023 with multiple testnet waves, giving us the chance, chance to see how the technology performed in a global distributed environment. From there, the community established a permanent testnet, and then, in May, mainnet launched. With about seven months of a full production environment, we saw new primitives such as ZK Login and big growth in DeFi metrics. Now, let's take a look at what we can expect in 2024. Joining me today from Miston Labs are Chief Product Officer Adani Abiedin and Chief Technology Officer Sam Blackshear. Well, let's begin with the introductions. Adani, tell me a little about your role and day-to-day -day work at Miston Labs. Hey, everyone. How are you doing? Can you hear me clearly? Yes, thank you. Good, okay. At least we know Twitter Spaces <laughs> is, is working. Well, X Spaces is working for once, and hopefully it can keep track. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Adini Abiodun. I am a Londoner, but now in the U.S. Um, I'm Chief Product Officer, one of the co-founders of Mistern. I have the pleasure of working with Sam, George Corsas, and, and Evan, um, co-founder of the company with them um, in 2021. But more about my day-to-day -day role. Um, as a Chief Product Officer, what I do is I obsess about the problems that people in our ecosystem has from whether it's a business related problem all the way to technical. And we try and find ways to build products and, um, um, and tools to effectively make their lives a lot easier. In fact, interesting fun fact, over the Christmas period, what I spent the majority of my time is actually dabbling into various DeFi protocols from lending on Navi, from, you know, um, open up LP positions on Turbos and Cetus, um, dealing with options on Typus, um, doing all sorts of degenerate things all over the holiday period just to see what builders are building and find areas in which I can even help consult and be, perhaps even a better user experience. Also, even things that we could be doing on InfraSide to to make the lives a lot easier. So I, I, would, I classify my role as I, I get to think, tinker a lot with what people are, are building. I get to spend a lot of time on Twitter. <laughs> and uh, I think one of my most exciting parts is actually engaging with the projects that I'm building on SWE. So I love talking to projects. I love working on projects. I love to see how we could support them to help them be successful. So that kind of explains my day-to-day. -day. Thank you, Adani. Um, Sam, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about your uh, role at Mistin and uh, same day-to-day -day activities? Yeah, Wayne, for sure. Um, I'm the co-founder and chief technology officer at Mistin. In my role, the most important thing I think I do and the thing I enjoy doing the most is talking to Swede builders and trying to understand what they're up to. This is to answer questions, to get their feedback on Swede developer experience, to understand what problems they're having and what we can do in terms of the platform design and engineering to to make their lives better and enable new capabilities, giving advice when that's appropriate, uh, just, you know, really understanding our customers and, and what they want from the platform. I also do a lot of work with Mistin engineers on design and implementation of the, the features that we're working on um, and on the, the stuff we have on the roadmap and then uh, incorporating that, that feedback from the suite developers. Also do a lot of work with the product folks at, at Mistin on how we build interesting products like ZK Send on top of on top of Sweet and really like leveraging what what Sweet can do. Um, I also keep a lot of tabs on what else is going on in the crypto space, uh, particularly from the technology perspective. What things are people talking about? What problems are other networks encountering? What are what are people excited about? And then I write and talk a lot about Sweet technology. It's it's differentiators with the respect to what else is going on in the space and how builders are, are squeezing the most out of it, what they can do on Sweet that they can't do anywhere else. Great. Thank you, Sam. Uh, back to you, Adani. I want to just quickly talk about the DeFi metrics we saw last year, because I think we're all a little bit blown away by the numbers. So can you just recap what uh, happened? Yeah. So um, if, if you're paying attention over the holiday, hopefully you spend time with your family and loved ones. But over the holidays, we saw SWE hit above 200 million in TVL or total value locked, which is a huge accomplishment for a chain that's only been live for seven months up to that point. Um, that surpasses the total value locked of assets of many chains that have been around for way, way longer than the seven months that we've been live. Um, TVL trajectory as a whole is up 500% since the start of September. So that that is a massive order of magnitude shift from where we started. 
and we really expect TVL to grow. We the, the goal is for Sweet to be easily in the top ten, and then within the space of a year to be in the top five in in terms of TVL. But what's more interesting is that there's been over 100 million in bridge stable coins um, in bridge into Sweet DeFi as well. And um, we've we've surpassed Bitcoin's total on chain historical transactions in the space of seven months too. So. Uh, what people have noticed is people have been doing inscriptions on SWE. They've been doing all sorts of wonderful activities on SWE. We've seen the TPS peak at 6,000 at times. No one notices because SWE is built to be horizontally scalable. It just You don't see any high fees. You don't see any slowdown in the network. Things just run as normal, and that's a testament to the technology the team has built. I think one of the most, thing, one of the most interesting things we're very excited about when it comes to DeFi is the volume. Like um, SWE volume is regularly in the top 10 of all chains. So volume is a better indicator of actual product market fit for DeFi than anything else because that shows that the TVL you have actually is useful. There are a lot of chains that have TVL but no real volume, and what we're seeing is organic growth on the volume on chain, which means SWE can give you really um, um, tight spreads and can give you very low costs of execution. And we think as you have more and more native assets um, onto, onto SWE over this year, you start to see that TVL increase and also the activity on chain as well increase too. Thanks, Sadani. And when we look at 2024 and DeFi in particular, uh, let's drill down on some of these subjects. Uh, you talked about bridging. Uh, what do you think or what do you expect for bridging tokens uh, to SWE in 2024? So the team is is on the way working on a, a SWE native bridge right now. Uh, and I believe that should be live so early part of this year. And that would give an alternative bridge. We, we actually have great work by the team at Wormhole, um, at the Wormhole team. And this is an additional bridge for those who want to use something altern- uh, as an alternative to bridge other ETH native assets directly onto SWE to increase the overall TVL. We actually think that would open up the doors for more assets coming directly from Ethereum over to SWE. Um, so we think the SWE story for bridging will be even stronger than it was in 2023, and that would help TVL and overall activity on, on the chain increase significantly. Beyond that, we have a lot of interest in um, you know, uh, other assets. And I think a lot of people in the community are asking questions about, you know, can we have Bitcoin on SWE? Can we have um, you know, other kind of chains on SWE? Can we have Bitcoin inscriptions on, on SWE? We are a very small team and we can't build everything. And I think the community is going to have a lot of hand in building a lot of these new tools as well. I'm very excited about what we're going to see. Yeah, it seems like there's a lot of opportunity for DeFi. Uh, we've opened a lot of a lot of doors for people. Are there any other segments uh, about DeFi specifically that you're really excited about for in 2024? I'm very, very excited about um, on-chain um, on, on-chain perps. I think the work that Aftermath is doing and Kree is doing, and we've all seen Bluefin go live with perps on SWE. Um, I'm very excited about what that's going to do because you know our thesis at the beginning is that. SWE is a high-performing chain, and what matters is actually the apps being built. It's great to talk about speed. I think everyone talks about speed and scalability. What we care about is what you can do with that you, with that, with that technology. And I think the technology being built by the Aftermath and Create team right now, where you're going to have, well, um, fully on-chain um, settlement and, and, and quotes and, and execution of perps, is going to be super powerful. It's probably going to be the first of its kind at that kind of scale. So they've already been testing in a test and they're, they're easily clearing over 2,000 trades per second with no problem. And we'd love to see that even spike even more as we, as, as we introduce more and more assets onto the pools. So very excited about um, the you know, kind of asset classes that you'll be able to be trading. I think there'll be other types of derivatives that would come onto SWE as a chain as well over time. And can you just give a little context about perps? Uh, you know, it's an interesting type of trading in options and derivatives. So I, I just want people to understand a little bit about what that means. Yeah, I mean, I'm not the I'm not the most um, knowledgeable financial expert, right? So um, I, I can give you a high level how it works. I've actually traded perps previously, so um, from what from what I can explain, so per, it, perps is like it's a perpetual future. So unlike traditional futures that um, have an actual date of settlement. Um, 
they these it's actually have a, a it, it's called perpetuals for a reason right like it, it doesn't have an expiry it just keeps on it keeps going and it is it, you have something called a funding rate that allows you to effectively fund the position and then you know it give, there's an ability to, to also um, use margin to either um, reduce you increase your capital efficiency but also you correct yourself significantly as a result too but yeah it's it is a future that doesn't have um, a settlement date that you can effectively just keep forever. Yeah, and there's a lot of excitement about these, and you can go long and short in them. So there's different ways of approaching them, uh, but uh, not not to dwell on that too much. Uh, yeah, Blue, wanna... Blue, Bluefin recently released Sweet Perps, um, so you can actually trade Sweet Perps today on Bluefin if you if you go to their website. You, and uh, over the year, over the year, you start to see new features where you can actually just use zk login to to start trading perps on, on on Bluefin, just like you would with your Coinbase account or your Binance account directly, without having having to worry about wallets. Great, yeah. And I just want to switch over to Sam to talk a little more about the uh, technical side. Uh, then this will be of interest to developers in particular. Um, Sam, can you talk a little bit about Move Edition twenty twenty four, the new roadmap that was posted on GitHub? Yeah, definitely. So there's a bunch of exciting changes that are coming to move in 2024. Some are at the core language level and some are a little bit higher up the stack in terms of the, the integration with SWE. So I'll talk a little bit. I'll talk first about the core language changes and then maybe about some of the other ones. So I think the one I'm personally most excited about is Enums. It's a feature that folks have requested for a long time. Uh, it really adds a lot of expressivity. It makes code a lot shorter and cleaner. It was really helpful for object versioning. You know, like let's say you're writing an order book and you have an original version of an order that has some number of fields and then you discover later that you need to add a new field. Today you can do that by tagging a dynamic field onto it, but that's just not quite as useful or as ergonomic as you just introduce like a you have you represent that order as an enum and you add a new variant in the enum that has a new field you want to destruct and then you're just sort of off and you have the the really nice static representation of the the order once again. So those are coming. I think it should be like um early fab that's gonna be a really huge feature. We're also adding macros, which are uh, a really powerful form of code reuse. So that lets you do things like you can do you can do mapped and folds and filters for folks who are familiar with stream programming from Rust or other languages like this. You can write for each loop, so you don't have to manually increment the uh, the loop counter anymore, which is something that uh, is is not that fun to do. We also have method style syntax. So like right now, if you're going to call a function in move, like you have to write the name of the module. Uh, and the function beforehand, and then you put the, um, and then you just pass all the arguments explicitly. But of course, it's very convenient to be able to write something like instead of vector colon colon pushback ampersand mute v seven, you write v dot pushback seven. Uh, it's it looks a lot more like what folks are familiar with elsewhere. It makes your code a lot shorter, and it's also um, and it also makes working with the the IDE much easier. So these are great quality. These are great quality of life improvement in the core language, uh, quality of life and expressivity improvements, especially in the, the case of Enum. So we're we're pumped about that. Going up this, yeah, I know. Oh. <laughs> uh, just to jump in here, I know the roadmap also is calling for some explicit, uh, more explicit uh, annotations, uh, things that people didn't have to do previously uh, to to on func or on structs. I think in particular, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so there's this let mute change where right now, if you're binding a variable, you always write let. Um, but once you introduce, and so something that's really important to us is whenever you're doing mutation, that should be really explicit. Once we introduce method style syntax. You you know if you write v dot pushback you can no longer see uh, without looking at the definition of uh, functionally pushback whether that call is going to mutate v or not and so what let mute is doing is it's continuing in this tradition of making mutations really explicit and so in that case what you'll need to do is you add a mute annotation to v so it'll be very obvious to the person who's reading or writing the code that that call is going to be a mutation. This also unifies the let syntax with uh, or makes the let syntax much much closer to the how the way Rust works, I think that's sort of a common point of confusion where folks are trying to add mutes and because they're used to Rust that they don't need to move and now those are going to work a lot more similarly. And I know some of these changes are feature-proofing the language for potential features down the line. Can you speak to that? I mean, everything we do is not, not just like adding a feature without uh, without regards to what the feature is going to look like. You know, we have a big picture of where we think the language is going to go, how things fit in with what's going on in the past. So, with anything that we're doing, we're always thinking about like how if we did this, how is this going to work with something we might want to add in the future? Uh, is this closing any doors that we don't want to close, and, and these sorts of things? So I'd say that's that's less of a specific thing, more of just like the way we approach language design, where it's not just add a feature because somebody's asking for it or because some other language has it. You have to think about 
the cohesive picture of the language as a whole. And the most important, the most important feature a language can have is cohesiveness and minimality. It's not a, it's not a collection of features. It's like a, it's a, it's a vision. It's something small and consistent. And so like we, you need to grow really carefully and deliberately. So I'd say this is more a philosophical thing than like something I can specifically point to on the features we're adding. Yeah, that's a good approach. Uh, well thought out. I also want to talk, uh, step back a little bit to infrastructure and talk about parallelization in the blockchain industry as a whole, because I know uh, there's some layer twos out there trying to add parallelization to other chains. Uh, can you uh, just speak to that in general? Yeah, I wanted to uh, I wanted to finish answering your previous question first, because I talked a little oh, sure. bit about the move 2024 features, but there's also these interesting ones that are sort of further up the stack. So we're adding this transfer to object feature, which is, I think, a really fundamentally new capability that allows for more power but it gives you a lot more power because before like you can just transfer to addresses or you can write objects uh, into other objects but being able to transfer an object lets you take advantage of the um, the SWE fast path consensus fast path in a lot more cases and also allows you to do things like it uh, it's also a powerful enabling feature for account abstraction in SWE. like you know if you want to have a wallet that has if you want to have an on-chain multi-sig wallet that has spending limits this space was downloaded via spacesdown.com visit to download your spaces today you can now do that by having an object and then you send payments to the object and then extracting them from the object that enforces the spending limits and this sort of thing so we're, we're i think we're pretty excited about that i know a lot of builders are looking at creative things to do with that there's also um we're doing a we're doing one in suite to try to make open source move for code published on mainnet the, the default so we've started having hosted source verification um the there's a link we can add in the the notes for the the for the show and also that we've shared uh, on various things where you can uh, you can send a pr to a repository uh that will get your source for on-chain mainnet code verified so it'll, it'll be visible on all explorers this is an api so any explorer client can integrate this and we're working on integrating that more deeply with the package management tools as well so that it's just easy to have the same experience you'd have with NPM or Cargo or something. You have the name of a project. That's what's in your dependencies file. You can pull the source for it. Uh, so we think that's really important. And we think the having open source by default is a, a prereq for, for trust and for having features like verification or like strong or, you know, pulling training data for LLMs. There's all sorts of things that you can do when you, you have the full source instead of just by code. Uh, so the, that's some of the stuff we're we're interested in besides the the core language features. Um, I'll, I'll pause there, but I can also ju uh, jump to your parallelization question. Um, yeah, I just want to drill down a little bit on the transfer to object. I know uh, some uh, builders are looking at how they can make their their projects more efficient, faster by changing from shared objects to single owner objects. Is that something they can do with transfer to object? Yeah, so I think in a lot of cases before where the you would have had to do something by interacting with a, a shared object, you can now use transfer to object and run that logic uh, on the back end when receiving the object instead. And so that does indeed let you take advantage of the the low latency fast path instead of using a, a shared object. You can't always you can't always do that, but I think there are a lot of cases where you can now take advantage of that. And I think that's a great segue into parallelization because that's one of Sui's strengths. Uh, so let's jump into that topic. Yeah, so right, I think your question was like, what's the importance of parallelization in the blockchain industry? So I would expand that and say like, this isn't just about the blockchain industry. Like if you have some sort of transaction processing system or just anything that's processing requests, like you need parallelization to scale throughput. Otherwise, like even though computers are very fast, like your if your application or your processing system has a sequential bottleneck it's going to be really limited in the amount of traffic it can handle and in the workloads it can handle and so i think the thing that SWE is doing um compared to others is that you know we are very aware of this and we designed it from the ground up with a data model to support parallelism in all phases of the transaction processing pipeline so for consensus like there's the work that george and alberto and left and other folks have done on narwhal so that you can factor out the consensus into a parallelizable part of data dissemination and leave the sequential bottleneck of ordering to just be as small as possible. Of course, there's, par there's parallelism in the execution layer, which is what a lot of other folks in the space are talking about. We have the data model so you can see in advance whether transactions are going to conflict. This gives you great upfront information about where conflicts might arise, That whether you have um, a wealth of different strategies for how to schedule transactions for parallel execution. And also parallel production of artifacts for auditing, like checkpoints that full nodes are going to use or that uh, folks who want to look at the transaction history will need after the fact, uh, both like produced. Oh, I think we might have lost you there for a second. 
I knew it. It was going too well for Twitter not to cut us off. It was going way too well. All right. <laughs> yeah. So let's uh, let's keep on rolling here. So um, we we'll, we might get back to paralyzation in a minute if Sam comes back on. But let's jump into the idea. I mean, one of the things that attracted me about Sweeney initially last year is there's a lot of maturity in the approach and the idea that this could have real world utility impact. So uh, Adani, can you talk a little bit about uh, what or what do you expect of SWE as far as real world projects in 2024? Yeah, um, we we don't agree with the statement that Web two and Web three are in competition at all. We actually think that's the wrong way to characterize where we're going. We actually think the reality is Web two is fantastic at certain things, right? Like Web two is built really great UX. Web two knows how to capture users, but Web two, um, in in a, in a sense, is has a very broken incentives model. Um, and to a large extent, we think Web3 is something that could be the layer to help that be more more effective. Um, ownership is just not something that happens really, really well in Web2. So we, we think a world where Web2 and Web3 works well together is actually the future. And this is why if you look at everything we built for SWE, it's very, uh, it's very centered around making developers' lives a lot easier, but also allowing developers to um, cater to a user base that's beyond just crypto. ZK Login is one example of that. So if you think about what is ZK Login, it's not just login. I know the name might give it, a, give it away to think it's just to do with login. It's actually more to do with how do you enable everyday users to engage with Web3 applications in a way that is very, um, it's, it's that, they're, that they're used to? How do we meet users, the, the six to seven billion users in the world, where they currently are, namely with their Web2 identities? And ZK Login does that while giving you full ownership of your keys and giving you full uh, agency over, over your assets. And we think that's a way to unlock um, Web3 to the masses. So imagine if you were building an exchange before, for example, Bluefin, and now you implement ZK Login. Now your audience that's targetable is way, way beyond the um, early adopters in, in crypto. So we think our, our, our vision is that more and more Web2 applications would actually integrate um, core components of Web3 in seamless ways. They'll be using ZK Login on the front end, but the user is unaware of what's happening and they can magically overnight start transferring assets that they own from one platform to another with ease without having to figure out what does gas mean <laughs> or having to figure out what does, you know, what is search pricing uh, and having to figure out anything to do related to crypto or addresses. So this is, these are the things that we're excited about. We think every application in the world in the future that has an element of ownership will be using SWE. That is our vision, and we believe that's to, um, going to be the case. We've already shown it in regards to the performance of our network. We've already shown it with the innovations that we have with ZK Login, that we have with Transfer to Objects, that we have all across the board with even on-chain randomness, right? Like we're constantly innovating to make developers' lives a lot easier to build very life-changing and game-changing apps. And we think SWE is going to be a part of every major application that has an element of ownership. Yeah, I see this as we can get the best of both worlds of Web 2 and Web 3 if you want to divide them that way. Uh, there's a lot of attributes of SWE and Web 3, like you said, ownership that can be brought in. But people have certain expectations in the Web 2 world of how to log on, how to how to activate, how, how to own things. So um, let's uh, – Sam, I want to get back to you. If, you. if you want to finish your thoughts on parallelization or jump right into this new topic about use cases for SWE in the real yeah, world. Yeah, let me build on what Andy is saying. Like I, I think to me the thing that – really excited about or I think that we're finally getting close to once we is having a proper product iteration cycle you know most of the time you don't just have this idea for like this is exactly what I need to build like you need to you need to try something you need to see how folks react to it you need to iterate you need to adjust you need to repeat that a thousand a thousand times at your company and then repeat that across uh, hundreds or thousands of other companies and that's how you actually find successful products it's not like you have the exact vision roadmap and have it go out the door I think in Web3, this has just been impossible to this point. Like you basically have to, even before you start experimenting, you have to pivot to, I'm now going to be a blockchain game or, you know, I'm going to be like a, a blockchain trading platform and these other things. It's not the case that you can just try it out, try out little parts of Web3 utility or integrate this as part of your stack to, to see what's going on. Uh, it's really, it's really, really hard to build anything, to integrate anything. And it's really expensive. So you have to have like huge conviction to try it out in the first place. And in addition, like, the f pool of folks you can experiment with is very small because it's problematic. You mentioned like, yeah, if you have to install a wallet, then, you know, there's 60 million wallet installs across all of crypto. And most of those folks are, you know, not 
I'm not going to try out uh, any given new app. And so you have a very small audience to do this iteration cycle and to experiment with. But with ZK Login, like that pool is now much, much larger. It's anybody with a web account. If you build something that's compelling, if it's providing a service or doing something that's useful for them, then they can try it out. And there's a lot fewer barriers to, to getting started. So I think that that's the thing that I'm really the most excited about for SWE in 2024 is the developer experience is good, but it, we have a lot of improvements we can make. But I think it's really getting to the point where, especially for specific areas, like, you know, say you're building a loyalty program, you're building a, you're building a marketplace for digital or physical assets. You're, you're launching, um, you're launching something that wants, um, protection of royalties via kiosk like we can make that really really easy for someone to just try out and see if it provides value for them and we can give them access to a much broader customer set via zk login yeah there's some exciting projects launching that, that leverage these things are there any particular uh, avenues you want to see go forward yeah, so I think uh, there are a couple of different things. So I think like the one of our key differentiators is just having ultra low latency. Like all things equal, people are gonna p- people are gonna pick the faster chain. So we're seeing a lot of uh, and not a test on this as well. We, we're seeing a lot of product market fit in DeFi for this reason. We have folks that have switched from other chains to Sui because they can get lower latency trading on Sui. Like Bluefin has done this. We have Solend who's expanding from Solana to Sui because they see the opportunities of ultra low latency and some of these other Sui features. And then we have Sui native DeFi builders like, um, the, you know, like Aftermath, like Kuna Labs, who picked Sui in the first place because of these ultra low latency features, and also because they see the the potential for scalability. So I think, like, I think of the the DeFi set as sort of the early, like, they're always going to be the early adopters for the use cases that are that really need low latency. But I think stuff like gaming, you know, this is more of a longer term thing because it takes a long time to build a successful game. Uh, like a lot of the that's going to come online or grow in 2024. Like we've seen. Arcade Champions has been very successful, but it's still in a very early, even for them, it's still in a very early like alpha beta testing phase instead of being a, a, a fully fledged game that's really like ramping up their growth. Payments, of course, is also very latency sensitive. Commerce, loyalty, all of these things that require like real world, real world interaction or sort of like user click and wait for the wait for an action. I, I think all that stuff are, are things that I'm uh, excited to see take off in 2024 and beyond. And one of the top metrics we we see for parallelization and uh, the fast time finality is you know, transactions per second. Is that a metric you look to constantly to see where we are and where we can get to? So I think that's of course a useful metric. I mean, it, and one that's talked about a lot in the space. Like it captures the the point. It captures the point in time usage of Sui, and you know we are consistently pushing a fairly a fairly high TPS, and we're not running out of capacity. We're not spiking the latency of user transactions or suffering downtime or slowness or other things like that. But I think like the the metric we were really focused on, and especially like in terms of setting the roadmap for the core team, is this latency. Because throughput is, throughput is about, you know, like what's the maximum use of, like what's the maximum usage of the chain. But as a builder, like the thing that touches everybody who inter- or, or user the thing that the thing that touches everyone who interacts with the chain on every transaction is latency. And so really like you want like all things equal, you want your latency to be as low as possible you will pick the chain where that latency is low. As long as that latency being low doesn't mean that you're sacrificing on the on the throughput or on the, the TPS side. So I think like, of course, like this is this is the metric that people in crypto talk about the most. But I think like in terms of what we design for and the way we are talking about the differentiators we going forward, we're going to be focusing especially on the, the ultra low latency because I think this is maybe our strongest differentiator. Yeah, I imagine a lot of projects will take that. It's you know that and uh, scalability; those are so crucial for especially large volume platforms. Uh, let's take a quick step back, look at the industry as a whole. Adani, can you talk? Are we entering a bull market? Uh, there's been a lot of talk about that lately. I mean, the the signals and the trends do kind of point towards that. Um, we we do think that 2024, the market's going to be quite bullish. Um, of course, a lot of eyes are on what's happened with ETS and institutional investors. We think just the promise of rate cuts and you, you marry the promise of rate cuts, the interest that's spiking from institutional investors, um, even, even, you know, we're seeing the same thing all over the show as well. And then, you know, the, the, the sentiment that we're seeing all across with, with token prices across the board is actually more of a signal that we are seeing a bullish um, sentiment increase across, across uh, the industry. I think overall, a lot of this is driven by FOMO, which 
it's always a case that you find in crypto, there's always an element of FOMO. And I think over time, what we hope and what we actually expect to happen is real value creation will happen. And then that people start to shift towards metrics that really does matter. Right now, it's all about excitement. Um, can you excite your base as much as possible? The reality is what really matters at the end of the day when the dust settles is, can, we, can you drive the metrics up? Can you drive the adoption of users? Can you make businesses profitable? Can DeFi protocols make money? Um, um, uh, can, can people who want to trade find great execution on your platform at the lowest cost, lowest latency, um, with the least amount of friction as possible? Can you onboard more users for a game and do that at very low user acquisition cost? These are the things that are really going to matter. And I think people start to evaluate platforms based on the merits rather than just the hype that it drives. And we really think consumer-based applications are going to drive that adoption significantly. I think if you if you think about if you think about it, right, that the, the amount of people in crypto is actually quite small. What we really need in this cycle is a growth of the user base. We need rather than fighting over the same users, we need to bring in more users, which is why I'm very excited about. I keep mentioning zk login for that reason. There are a ton of DeFi protocols in SWE that will start implementing a lot of these core features in the ecosystem that would make it possible for the average day-to-day -day user to start engaging with their protocol, which means now you have more customers who can engage and benefit from your protocol beyond just the crypto savvy. And I, we believe for all that, SWE is set up to be the best and the most successful platform that can actually deal with real world use cases. We are already parallelizable. We already can deal with high volume, high demand and no, no downtime. We already have the, print, the primitives that enables people to onboard at scale into our ecosystem. We already have a DeFi ecosystem that's growing probably faster than the majority of ecosystems that have been around for a very long time. So we are executing and we're executing on all cylinders and we're showing that we can actually drive these metrics up significantly. So very excited about 2024. I think the market's going to be bullish for a while. And I think more importantly, we have to keep our head down and build value, build value so builders can actually build the best apps that they exist in the ecosystem. That's a great point. And I think what <laughs> distilling that down, we want to see a bull market in users, not necessarily in NFTs or, or what have you. Exactly. <laughs> um, I know we've used up a lot of your time today. Uh, let's just get down to final thoughts as we close out this session. Uh, Sam, do you want to give any uh, final thoughts about 2024 and SWE? I think I've covered most of the most of the points that I'm excited about from a, a techno perspective. I think it's covered a lot of the ecosystem bits. I mean, I guess the only thing I would close with is just to say, you know, we we really want to hear from the community builders and the community of builders uh, from the from, sorry, the community of builders, the community of users. What are we not talking about that you're really interested in? What are the problems you're encountering? What would you like to see? I think the this feedback loop and pulling folks in to get involved in, in sweet core development and the roadmap is something that uh, we really want to work on in 2024 as well. So please uh, don't be shy. Great. Thank you, Sam. And uh, Adam, do you want to add anything? I know there was a particular email that went out to save the date. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So we, uh, everybody, um, mark this down. There is a big, big um, SWE annual conference. It's going to be happening the same time every year. There's an annual conference that's going to be coming for SWE. We expect to have over a thousand um, developers at this conference. So mark the date down. Tickets will be available soon. It's going to be huge. We're going to be talking about all the wonderful new features coming onto SWE. There is consensus v2 we're going to be talking about there's going to be a lot of new builders who you recognize that we've not announced yet um a lot of uh, in, in large in um large multinational companies that you know very very well that are going to be taking center stage as well so it's going to be a big event that's all i can say we're very excited we're pumped we can't wait to share all the awesome things happening in sui and we want the builders to be there to see what's hap actually happening and all the work they've done to build uh, a, a remarkable um ecosystem Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Adani. This is an exciting year for SWE, uh, and we're going to be conducting these sessions at periodically, uh, almost weekly throughout the year. So please uh, keep attuned to our Twitter and announcements about when these sessions occur and the subject matter. Uh, be looking forward to having you join us again. Thank you very much. Thanks, Wayne. I appreciate it. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, everyone. Bye.